I come from a generation, three generations of family in prison. My grandfather, my father, and yes, myself. Now I do know what you're thinking. I look like a very middle-class, middle-aged, suburban soccer mom, and you would be right, I am all of those things. But I've also been in prison, but for a vastly different reason than you may be thinking. So our family story starts kind of like a Hollywood movie. The scene is the 1920s to the 1950s in San Francisco. The leading man was my grandfather, very charming. He was also a talented artist and woodworker and a patent holding inventor, I might add. And as many uh, young men from his era, he was a veteran of the US Army. As Hollywood stories go, he was also married to a beautiful young model at that time. He um, also, unfortunately, was a repeat offender of petty crimes and therefore a repeat long-term resident of the Fresno County Jail and San Quentin Penitentiary. Talk about awkward family photos, right? Imagine walking into a living room and seeing a framed mugshot of your grandfather on the mantle. <laughs> As uh, Hollywood stories go, also, he was the mastermind of a prison break, and this is a true story. There's a newspaper article that tells that he was the mastermind behind a prison break. They picked locks and they tunneled through a brick wall and they slid 15 feet down a fire hose. Now, all eight got recaptured within the next few days, but I do have to admit that I was, uh, my heart did swell with a little pride when I read that it was my grandfather that was the brains behind the break. You gotta take what you can get when this is your family history, right? As is the story with all of us. There are many different sides to one person. Society would deem my grandfather, while wearing his prison uniform, as a useless criminal. One of those people we might call the invisibles in society. And you know who they are. They're the homeless, the drug addicted, the incarcerated, the poor. Those people that we may choose not to see. So how many times have you driven by a prison or walked by a homeless person and barely noticed them? or it, I know I have. How many times have we thought about them as being created by God with gifts and talents and purpose, just like you and just like me? As someone's sister or brother or child or grandfather? Okay, so as the story goes, the beautiful young model my grandfather was married to was my grandmother. She was an alcoholic. She, uh, after many divorces and remarriages later, she fell while intoxicated and hit her head and passed away. So you see, my father was the son of an incarcerated man and um, an alcoholic mother. Statistically speaking, odds weren't that good for him. Do you know that children of an incarcerated parent are six times more likely to become justice involved? And it's just kind of a fancy term, but it, it means uh, being like in a juvenile facility or arrested or actually in prison. And the statistic for a lineage of incarceration or generational imprisonment is 50%. But there's a plot twist to this story. My father and myself put ourselves in prison. Yeah, we put ourselves in prison. Did you know you could do that? You actually can put yourself in prison and we did that to be mentors to those incarcerated. Because you see, we knew my grandfather had value, even while in his prison uniform. And it created in us an overwhelming yearning to share with others in prison that they also have value and that they are worthy of being seen. Now, did my heart raise and my knees shake the first time that I walked into prison? Yes, I felt very vulnerable. I walked through the metal detector and through heavy metal doors and down a hallway. And uh, a guard you know, put me in this little room. I sat behind the table. I opened up my paper. I had all these words of wisdom that I was going to impart 
on these people. And two young nervous girls walked in the room and we started talking. And soon I folded the paper up and put it aside. I didn't need those carefully crafted words of wisdom. We talked and we shared and we cried and we prayed together. And what these girls needed was basic human connection. So we shared and they left and they felt heard and they felt seen and I felt greatly humbled. So you see, there is a way to alter statistics and to change someone's story. And this is how it happens. Ready? It's huge. It's care. That's it. One little word. And I know you're thinking, that's pretty cheesy. That's so sunshiny. But that is the way you change lives. You care about others. Because someone cared about my father, that young man in the white t-shirt with a, a father in prison and a mother, um, an alcoholic mother, because someone cared about my father, my father became a minister instead of an inmate. He pastored three churches over 30 years, ministered to thousands of people, was married to my mother for 67 years, had five children, 17 grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren, with none of them in prison. And because my father cared about others, um, I was able to care about others. And I have the privilege of standing on this TED stage to share the importance of care with you, instead of perhaps behind prison bars, as statistics would have predicted 50% chance. When myself and other everyday people, volunteers, and yes, other chaplains and trauma healing facilitators walk into a prison or a transitional home or serve the homeless on the street, we hear terrible stories of abuse and neglect and unaddressed health issues and all sorts of trauma, and it breaks our hearts, but we still see in them so much value that they have stopped seeing in themselves. Do you know the United States leads the world in incarcerations? Extended stays that don't always fit the crime. And I'm not talking about violent crimes and violent criminals, but extended stays for misdemeanors that wreak havoc on families and finances and communities, relationships, parenting. What if we did more to care for these people? I mean, we all have either time, talents, or resources. What if communities created mentor-run, volunteer-run healing centers instead of creating more prisons or overcrowding the prisons that we already have? What if we created mentor-run healing centers where we walk these people through the processes needed to heal their traumas and show them the importance of caring for their bodies instead of destroying them with drugs as they so often do and invite them to unveil spiritual truths so that they can heal their souls and that would help them renew their minds and enlighten them to a more hopeful future. And most of all, help them discover their talents and their gifts so that they can serve this purpose in this world, their purpose, just like we can, just like you and just like I can. So my question is, what kind of humans will we be? You watching here at Bellarmine University or you watching on your phones or computers at home, will you be willing to really dig down deep inside yourselves and discover what you have to offer someone else, ways in which you could step in and care? There are countless organizations in every community, countless charities. Honestly, it's just a Google search, charities near me. Will we be dismayed by the faces of the broken, or will we continue to turn a blind eye? Now, there's a reason that some of you, even a smaller percentage of you, feel a greater tug on your heart to serve and to care. And that's because it's God or the universe or whatever you believe in telling you that this is part of your purpose. And I implore you, do not turn away from that because you could be the one to mentor one other person like my father and change a legacy like mine, four generations and counting. 
I'd like to end with a quote from anthropologist Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you.